If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Welcome back for part two of this two-part debate. Reverend Moon is a religious leader from Korea with a worldwide following of millions of people. Some time ago, a four-hour TV series was shown from Christian Answers called Moonstruck, an analysis of Reverend Moon's Unification Church. Some people from the Unification Church wanted to respond to the series in general and what was said about Reverend Moon in particular. This video is a response to this as a debate between Erling and Laura Lee from the Unification Church and Steve Morrison and Larry Wessels from Christian Answers, who were the speakers in the Moonstruck video. When people have differences of opinion, even as wide a difference as the participants have on Reverend Moon, it is best not to ignore those differences or forcibly try to coerce people to your viewpoint. Rather, the differences should be openly and freely discussed as will be done here. As you watch, there are a few things to keep in mind. If a participant does not specifically respond to a point, that does not mean he endorses the point or admits the point is true. Before Erling, Laura, Steve, and Larry begin, I was asked to read some points Christians and Unificationists agree on. There is a personal God, and he wants us to follow him. The Bible is from God. God commands us to do many things. Among these commands, we agree that people are never supposed to steal, murder, use illegal drugs, get drunk, have any kind of homosexual relations, or have sexual relations apart from marriage. People should be able to discuss their differences, theological and otherwise. Now we will begin with Steve. 1 John 2.18 says that there are many antichrists that have come. 1 John chapter 4 uh, says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. As you can see from the chart, there indeed have been many false prophets who have come into the world. This list is by no means exhaustive, but it's interesting just to see how many people have claimed to be either Christ come the second time, Christ come the first time, or like Lord Hakim, uh, just plain visible God. So how do we tell uh, if someone is Christ or not? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 2 through 4, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure version to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. So Paul is jealous that we would follow a different Jesus, or a different gospel, or a different Christ. And some of these people who are these um, false messiahs were almost kind of humorous. Like uh, Maharaji for the Divine Light Mission, he says he came in the clouds because he flew from India to America in an airplane. Many other people have come to uh, America uh, espousing Hinduism, or at least what they call Hinduism. A Hindu friend of mine even says that the reason they all come to America is because the people in India aren't so gullible. A personal coworker, a friend of mine, a coworker uh, in a previous job, he was basically let go of his job because he believed that he was Christ come again. And the scary thing about him is that he said a few things that were similar to what Reverend Moon said, and I'm almost certain that he had no uh, contact with Unification Church or Unification Theology. And this idea, I understand I'm not unique in having a friend like this. Uh, psychologists ha call what they have a messiah complex of people who have this. I don't think of this in psychological terms alone, though. I believe that there is a, is a spiritual force that seeks to make people think they're messiahs and if you think and call yourself a Christ and you're not a Christ, then you're an antichrist. 
So, I mean, if Reverend Moon really was Christ come again, uh, then we should follow him. But if he claims to be uh, the, the Messiah come again and he's not, then he is an antichrist. And I guess I'd like to ask uh, uh, you, Erling, and, and Laura to respond as to what do you think that a person can tell from the Bible, uh, you know, how someone could tell uh, uh, about Christ's return? Um. Yes, it's true. It's very interesting that also at the time of Jesus, there were numerous people claiming to be the Lord, claiming to be the Messiah. Um, so Jesus said that you will know him by his fruits. You can know a tree by its fruits. And if the tree is good, if the fruit is good, the tree is good. So one way I can say that I know that Reverend Moon is a man of God is by the extensive godly work that he's doing. Um, he has founded hundreds of organizations for the sake of world peace and is drawing ministers together from every denomination, is drawing uh, people from different religious perspectives together for the sake of world peace centered on God. He teaches about the family uh, and about the crucial nature of love within the family for the sake of society. Um, his work is just unparalleled. He has the Summit Council for World Peace, which gathers uh, presidents of countries and former presidents of countries to discuss world peace and how to uh, develop a peaceful movement within the world. The International Conference for the Unity of Sciences gathers uh, scientists from the hard sciences and the soft sciences. Nobel Prize uh, laureates participate. Uh, so that they can use their various talents and, and training for the sake of the development of humankind. Um, so that's one way that Jesus said we can know. The whole issue of understanding prophecy and whether or not prophecy comes from God is repeated. Jesus indicated, he said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Uh, he said, now I speak... Um, now I speak in figures, but the day will come when I speak plainly of the Father. It's interesting that his disciples said, Lord, you already speak plainly. His disciples disagreed with him on this point, but Jesus indicated clearly, there's much in my heart that I cannot share with you at this time. Then in the book of Revelations, there are references to uh, the truth, a scroll that, that uh, no one was found worthy to open except the Lamb. I'm speaking of Revelations 5 and and 10. Uh, the angel had in his hand a little book um, which was open but the, uh, John was forbidden to write about it. It will make your stomach bitter but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. You must again prophesy concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So the idea that God will reveal a truth in the last days is, is expressed through the book of Revelation. Uh, the book of Revelation says that Christ will come bearing a new name. So there's, there is a sense of how, how can we understand the Bible? How can we understand God's heart? The teaching that Reverend Moon brings is the strongest evidence for his messiahship. He explains very deeply and very clearly the answer to questions that I had when I was 10 years old. I began to, well, I, I went to Sunday school and uh, I couldn't understand why only Christians go to heaven. I, I couldn't understand it, and I was weeping. I went home and I prayed for half an hour, and then I saw a vision of the face of Jesus. So I began to search when I was 10 years old, and I had many questions stemming from the fact that I'm Jewish and Christian in heritage. Uh, and Reverend Moon's teaching about why God created and how God created and why is humanity separated from God, what is the fall of man, all of these uh, questions have been answered to me through the teaching. Um, more clearly, who was Jesus and what it, so many of his statements seemed mysterious to me when I read the Gospels. Uh, the relationship between Jesus and the Jews was a question that I had naturally. Um, and then the whole question of how God is working through Christianity in a world that is filled with suffering. So Reverend Moon, I believe, is the Messiah because of the works that he's doing. The fruit is good. The tree is good. He's definitely a man of God. And because of the profound uh, quality of the teaching, uh, how it appeals to my helping me understand the book, the Bible. And then when I apply this teaching in my daily life, I have experienced rebirth. I have experienced healing and new life. So these are the, the uh, reasons why. 
I believe Reverend Moon to be the Lord of the Second Advent. I'd like to respond to that by uh, stressing something that I brought up in uh, part one of this debate. And that was uh, asking a question about uh, what does the Unification Church think of the inspiration of Scripture? What, is, what does the Unification Church say about the Bible, the Scripture here? And uh, before I tell you, I, I don't think I got a clear answer on that from the last hour. I'll, I'll give Laura or Erling the chance to reiterate that. But let me read a few verses here and uh, to try to give us an idea from what the Scripture itself is teaching us about uh, itself and then tie this in with Reverend Moon and the things that have just been said about him. Uh, looking at uh, Matthew, uh, well, let me, go, let me go to this other one first. Psalm 138, verse 2, it says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, Paul gives the standard. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord, end quote. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 through 16 says, And how, firm, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and ye will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came uh, from the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here's Peter's talking about the other scriptures that were given by the apostles and prophets. Isaiah verse 40, verse 8, The grass withers and the flower uh, fall, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. In Jeremiah it says, God's word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock, the pieces. Uh, it says in Psalm 119, the, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12, the, the word of God is uh, like a two-edged sword that's sharper and, and dividing asunder, you know, bone and marrow and so forth. And I could go on with scripture after scripture after scripture, stressing the importance of the word of God, even Jesus in his temptation by the devil there in Matthew chapter 4 and also Luke chapter 4, the devil tempting him for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. What did Jesus keep saying? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. People usually don't remember that last part there. But Jesus kept responding to the devil's temptations from the scripture, from the word. And now we, we get into the things that were said here by Erling and Laura. Uh, particularly Laura here in this last uh, 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 statement she made about uh, Reverend Moon. She's saying all these good works he's done and things of this nature. But uh, when we look in the scripture, which Jesus talked so often about uh, and quoted uh, as, as with authority, uh, what do we find in that scripture? Well, when we go to places like... Uh, 1 Timothy, if I can get my reference here without losing everything, it, it says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4, it's in verse 6, it says, If thou put the, the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And he goes on in verse 13, Till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And as we go on into 2 Timothy, it's the same old story. Over and over again, we're told to watch the doctrine, the teachings. Uh, it, it, we're warned that there's doctrines of devils and uh, false teachers, false prophets bringing deceptions about God. And uh, this is where I want to take issue with Laura and Erling about Reverend Moon. I believe Reverend Moon is teaching false doctrine, not only about God. He's not telling the truth about God, uh, thereby 
teaching and preaching false doctrine, which we're warned to it, take heed unto ourselves to in the scripture. Jesus made this clear too about the teaching. But when we go to, go to uh, the divine principle by Reverend Moon, I'm looking here on page 131. Reverend Moon says, Jesus did not say that his word was the truth, but that he himself was the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. This is because his words were only a means of expressing himself as the truth. He goes on down here to talk about the New Testament on the same page. New Te the New Testament was given as a textbook for the teaching of truth to the people of 2,000 years ago, people whose spiritual and intellectual standard was very low compared to that of today. Today, the truth must appear with a higher standard and with a scientific method. And he goes on to say, as noted, the Bible is not the truth it, itself, but a textbook teaching us the truth. So here we have in very clear terms from Reverend Moon, what does he have to do? He has to get rid of the Bible and say it's not the truth. It's just a textbook teaching the truth. But what is the truth? Wherever Reverend Moon agrees with the Bible, he says that's the truth. But if it doesn't agree with what he teaches, then apparently that's not the truth. And uh, so we have this discrepancy. He's quoting Jesus, like we just saw here from the divine principle. He quotes Jesus in John 14, 6. But then we see other scriptures that I could quote from John or other places as I have where they wouldn't believe it for a moment. And, of course, this ties in with the, their doctrine. He wants to replace this, the teaching of the scripture with his own teaching as found in the divine principle. Now, with that said, I could say a lot more, but I want to give time now to Laura and Erling to respond to that and to make any comments mm -hmm. they would like to make on any, any subject. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, again, I'd like to speak about Jesus' own attitude towards the scriptures. He uh, obviously said that not one jot or tittle of the scriptures will pass away. He um, quoted the scriptures that the Jews were familiar with, and he obviously was a Jew. He loved God and followed the Jewish practices. However, uh, his, the accusation against him, the primary accusation against him was blasphemy and heresy. Uh, the constant question with which he was confronted um, for this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So they accused him of breaking the Sabbath, and that was blasphemy, to say that he was equal to God or the Son of God. Um, they accused him. He has gone to be... He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. He spoke to women, which was unthinkable. He spoke to Samaritans. Um, he was, he, they said, why do, you, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Why do you eat and drink with taxpayers, tax gatherers and sinners? That was their question to him. That was the crime for which he was killed, was blasphemy and heresy. Um, so at the same time, we know that Jesus loved God, that he loved the scriptures. However, he said in um, John 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness of me. In the same way, so Jesus is saying, you are glued to the word of the, you're glued to the literal words that are put in front of you, and as a result, your heart is closed to the deeper meaning that they bear. It's interesting that the disciples of Christ asked him, why then, Lord, do the people say that Elijah must come first? This is uh, after the Mount of Transfiguration. They didn't understand why the people expected Elijah to come. Apparently, they were not familiar with the book of Malachi that prophesied that first Elijah would come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So the ones who followed Jesus were not one of them a biblical scholar until Paul, who, who had this undeniable experience that wrested him away from the practice of killing Christians. So Jesus' uh, experience of having to battle with the conceptual um, reaction to the scripture that had nothing to do with the heart, that was not sensitive to the heart of God manifested through Jesus, is a similar problem to the one that Reverend Moon is having with Christians who cling to the literal word of the scripture without opening their mind and heart to the possible meanings of the words. For example, 
in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees at the center of the garden. Uh, tree is obviously and frequently used as a symbol for humanity in the book of Revelations, in the book of Genesis, in the book of Psalms and Proverbs. A tree often is a symbol for mankind. I am the vine, you are the branches. I am the true olive tree, you are the wild olive trees. Uh, so in the middle of the garden there were two trees and on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil grew a fruit. Do you really think it's a literal fruit? I have never seen the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the grocery store and I don't know any horticulturists who are familiar with the tree of life. These are symbols, so we have to think deeply, what is the deeper meaning behind this story, this profound and, and uh, tragic uh, story from the history of humanity? What is God telling us through this piece of scripture? So my understanding of the Bible is, is that it's the word of God. I feel very respectful and loving towards the scripture. I love Jesus Christ and I cherish his word, but it's because of his word that I think more deeply about what is he really saying. Why? Because my ancestors read the scriptures and, and called him heretic, crucify him. So now I am not quick to do the same thing. I'm not quick to say, you know, you don't, your understanding is different from mine, therefore you are damned. So I guess that's the, that's my response, is that the word of, uh, what Reverend Moon is teaching springs forth from the scripture, it springs forth from the Bible, and can be confirmed through study of the Bible. Uh, in response to that, in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, uh, it gives, it, tell, it tells a true story about there was a slave girl uh, who was demon possessed. And when Paul was around preaching, uh, she followed after Paul. And she said, or the demon insider said, said, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, if you think about that, that's really odd for a demon-possessed woman to be saying that. I mean, that is true, but it's very odd. And why did that happen? Well, that, ha that kept happening all the time until finally uh, in verse 18 Paul turns around and says in the name of Jesus I command you to come out of her and that Paul you know cast the demon out of her because he didn't want her to do that anymore well why would that be wrong for her to say that well I think my opinion is that the problem was that, that she would say that and the people would assume that she and the demon in her were associated with Paul and then uh, after Paul left then the demon her could teach whatever. And so the fact that uh, the people do believe some true things and uh, does not mean that you should necessarily follow them. For example, with family values. All right, uh, Christians uh, generally emphasize very much family values. I will agree that uh, unificationists also emphasize family values. Uh, for that matter, Mormons do. For that matter, uh, black Muslims do, at least um, among black families. Um, but the fact that all these people stress family values doesn't mean that they're following the, the same God. And family values are important, but of course they aren't more important than following the, the right God. Uh, as, as to the, the trees, and the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil and the tree of life, well the tree of life is mentioned later on in Revelation chapter 22 verse 2. And I believe that there's nothing in the scripture that says, since it's not a literal tree, that why couldn't it be a literal tree? In other places, maybe the vines uh, and other stuff did relate to people, and there are some analogies in the Bible, but they're clearly analogies. And it is a temptation to, I guess, make something into an, to an analogy, uh, or an allegory rather, anything that doesn't exactly fit the theology, and I see no reason other than for fitting a particular unification theology to make that analogy. Uh, one thing about Jesus uh, 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 and the Old Testament, okay, Jesus, uh, he uh, broke all kinds of rules of men. He, did he really break the Sabbath? Well, the, the Jewish Pharisees, they had many funny rules about the Sabbath, like you could walk one mile but not two. You couldn't uh, crush grain in, in your hands, which Jesus' disciples did a little bit broke because that was threshing bread. And even among some Hasidic Jews today, you have some interesting things. They hire people to, non-Jews, to stay with them on the Sabbath so they can turn on light switches and, and, and things like that. And so Jesus did break the rules of men. But on the rules that were from God, he didn't break them, except I will say that some were superseded. In the Old Testament, you had to have all these blood sacrifices, which the Jews pretty much stopped after the destruction of the temple. But, uh, but for Christians, those sacrifices are done 
for us one time by Jesus Christ, and so that's why we do not do any blood sacrifices anymore of, of, of animals and various things. Uh, in uh, t talking about uh, Elijah versus John the Baptist in Malachi, it says that Elijah will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Did not say Elijah will come before the Messiah is born or before the, or, or before the Messiah comes again, or, or it says before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The great and dreadful day of the Lord had not happened, okay? And so the, the, the fact that Elijah in person did not come, uh, you know, uh, uh, while, when Jesus began his ministry is not a problem, okay? Uh, but in, in general, you know, either Reverend Moon, uh, for the stuff he says about family values, either he's leading people to a false messiah himself, or he's leading people to a true messiah. And if, and, and, you know, you say, by your fruit, you'll know him. Well, you have to look at all the fruit. The fact that he says good things about family values isn't enough. You also have to look at what does he say about Jesus? Uh, when he actually said that he was greater than Jesus, um, that kind of makes me feel kind of strange. Uh, when, when he actually says things like, um, other people's saints or bodies were invaded by Satan. Jesus' body was invaded by Satan. Uh, you know, that makes me, makes me feel kind of, of, of strange, too. So why don't I maybe stop at this point and give you all a chance to respond. I'd like to say that we never uh, indicated that Jesus' body was invaded by Satan. We said Jesus' body was taken by Satan through the crucifixion. In other words, it was not God's will that Jesus be crucified. Um, you can understand that because the Bible says that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot and uh, through uh, Judas, Satan attacked Jesus. Through Judas, uh, Jesus was betrayed. We believe this is against the will of God. Um, one supportive fact, one supportive way to understand that is that uh, Jesus said, woe to the man who betrays me. It would have been better for that person had he not been born. If Judas had really done the will of God by betraying Jesus, he should be a celebrated saint. Um, so, but the Bible says Jesus' uh, Jesus's body was um, take, taken by Satan through the crucifixion. It was against the will of God that Jesus be crucified. How do we know that? Because Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, when Jesus cried out, uh, please let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, as thou wilt, Jesus was not afraid for himself. He was not um, a coward. He wasn't afraid to die. He had no reason to be afraid to die. And he was certainly far above any kind of physical fear of suffering. Um, compare his death to that of Peter, who requested to be crucified upside down. Jesus was uh, weeping for the sake of the people. Uh, soon after his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, a woman is weeping, and he says, don't weep for me, but weep for yourself. Weep for the children and of the future because they will suffer because of my crucifixion. I'm trying to remember the other point that you made, Steve. There was one other point that you wanted me to address? Besides, no, we don't believe that Jesus' body was invaded by Satan, that Jesus himself was invaded by Satan. We don't believe that, no. But we do see that, it, I mean, it's the same thing as you were just quoting about the demon that came into the little girl in the book of Acts. We believe that that happens and that that happened to Judas. In response to this, I'd like to uh, quote once again uh, Reverend Moon's Divine Principle, page 147 through 148, quote, because the Jewish people disbelieved Jesus and delivered him up for crucifixion, his body was invaded by Satan and he was killed. Therefore, even when Christians believe in and become one body with Jesus, whose body was invaded by Satan, their body still remains subject to Satan's invasion, end quote. And uh, the things you were saying basically about uh, uh, Jesus, it wasn't God's intention to have Christ crucified or delivered up. Uh, the, this is clearly refuted in Scripture throughout. Uh, we can go to uh, uh, John chapter 2, for instance, where Jesus is debating the Jews there uh, in the temple area. And he says, uh, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And, of course, uh, they thought he was talking about the temple itself, but he was actually talking about the temple of his body, as the scripture talks about. He knew, and he had prophesied many times in the scripture, that he was going, we're going to go up to Jerusalem 
where the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of the sinners and will be killed and crucified. He knew exactly what was going to happen. It was predicted for him. And in Acts chapter 2, on the, the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter is preaching. And uh, let me see, I don't have that reference right here, but it's Acts chapter 2, verse 23, if I can get there through all this literature I have in my hand, with hopefully not dropping it, but we find in the, uh, it says here, him talking about Jesus being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Here, it was, it was brought the, that Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. We find uh, there's prophecies, even in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 9, I believe it's verses uh, 24 through 27. You have the prophet Daniel there prophesying that the uh, Messiah will be killed. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament and fulfillments of this uh, coming crucifixion and death of the Messiah. Uh, look at Isaiah 53, which talks about how uh, he, w he was uh, slain for our, uh, well, once again, let me uh, just see if I can read the verse itself there out of the Old Testament prophet. Uh, this is written a long time before Jesus is even born. And uh, here we have the, the prophet saying uh, in verse 3, in, verse, in chapter 53 of Isaiah, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not uh, esteem him stricken. Uh, yet we did esteem, esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And it goes on to talk all about like a, he was like a lamb to the slaughter. And, and in verse 10 is key here. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he had put him to grief. Then uh, shall, uh, and, and when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see a seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Here we have concrete verses, uh, prophecies in the Old Testament, talking about the coming Messiah, who's going to die for the transgressions, the iniquities of the sinners. That's exactly what Jesus preached. That's the gospel message. That's the gospel that the, the Apostle Paul talked about in Galatians chapter 1, verse uh, 6 and following, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the gra uh, unto, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that uh, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. In the Greek there, it's anathema. Let him be damned. It's the strongest word he could have used for damnation. Anyone preaching a different gospel, a different way of salvation, other than through Jesus Christ and his shed blood on a cross, this is exactly denied by Reverend Moon. Reverend Moon says he talks to all these people like Confucius, and Buddha, and all these other uh, ascended masters and avatars and, and, and people in the spirit world that are telling them this different gospel, this different way of salvation, this different doctrine of God. Well, what we find in, in Scripture here, and, and put adamantly by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, if even an angel from heaven preaches a different gospel, let him be damned, let him be accursed. And here, Reverend Moon teaches this gospel in the divine principle, uh, apparently from after having discussions with who knows what people in the spirit world, which could include angels, it's definitely different. It's a different gospel. And uh, with that said, I'd like to once again give the floor to Erling and Laura to respond to this. Are you really preaching, as I see it, a completely different gospel? And do you see from the words of the apostle uh, 
condemnation for having a different gospel. Yeah, I'd like to answer that on that, uh, Larry. Uh, first of all, I want to mention that uh, in our theological seminar, we have uh, men, uh, professors and teachers in theology that is not member of Unification Church and they teach the Bible. So, uh, our teaching is based on it's based on the Bible. It has uh, everything it quotes in the Bible. Uh, it goes back and it has, it, it's, I don't see any difference between the Bible and the divine principle. Uh, there's an Old Testament, there's a New Testament, and, and there's a complete Testament. We believe that the divine principle is the complete Testament age. Um, I want to get into a few things about um, Jesus' crucifixion. Paul has said that uh, the good I want to do, I'm not doing, but the evil I want to do, I'm doing. So he saw it as a conflict in his body, and his mind and his body. His mind wants to do one thing, but his body did other thing. That's what we mean, that's our body getting invaded by Satan. It means there's still evil in the world, in, on earth today, that we can receive a spiritual salvation, we can receive peace and, uh, and, and grace through God and Christ. Um, that's why we're receiving spirit, but we believe actually uh, a kingdom of heaven and earth could be built at Christ's time. Uh, in Isaiah 53, in, in the Old Testament, there's two, two uh, prophecies about Christ. Uh, there's a uh, prophesies in Isaiah 9, chapter 9, 11, and 60, and Luke 1, 31, 33, about he's going to come as a king of kings, and there's a prophecy about he's going to come as a, as, as a king of suffering. And we believe God gave this prophecy, it's just like he gave Adam and Eve, if you eat at a tree and all is good and evil, you will die, and if you don't eat, you will live. And the poss God actually saw the possibility that actually he wanted Christ to come as a king of kings. It means that a kingdom of heaven actually could be established at that time. And, uh, but because of the opposition uh, in his work, he ended up getting crucified. If Christ will have denied his mission, his position, then there will be no salvation. I mean, then it will be really hell on earth. There will be no hope at all. But because he never denied that, because of that, we could say a spiritual salvation to, to the cross and to the resurrection. That's what we teach. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, Barry Moon teaches everything based on the Bible. He teaches, uh, you mentioned it, there's a, there's a few things when he mentioned he's the Messiah. I mean, it's a very few occasions where he talks about it because he talks about, most of the time he talks about how God wanted to create an ideal world. And because of uh, Satan and Eve aided uh, the fall, Adam and Eve, he couldn't do it. And that's the original for everything. And that's what we go back to all the time, is to create the kingdom of heaven and earth. And everything is teaching is, is, you can always compare it to the Bible. You always can go back to the Bible. There's no difference. I've never seen any difference between the divine principle and the Bible. Uh, for example, uh, Karl Marx, he taught God is dead and the religion is open on the people. And there was not many people in the Western world that op opposed him. And what well, ended up 150 million died because of his ideology. And he was not very criticized. Actually, people was more occupied criticizing Ray Moon at that time than were, they were criticizing Karl Marx's teaching. Uh, this, um, about this, this thing, even, even the, uh, in the uh, Lord of the Second Coming, it, it, the Bible talks about a revelation that there may not be faith on earth. So there's a possibility even that the Lord of the Second Coming comes back, there will be opposition. I think, uh, you know, if we constantly go on a Bible verse or a Bible verse and just find uh, life in them by itself, you know, we're not doing the right thing because many times we can see something good is done, but because uh, it's not in the Bible, then we say we look at it as an evil thing. And uh, God, uh, you know, uh, God is giving us a mind and a body and a brain too to see with that and uh, trying to uh, work with that, because if Christ comes back, you know, he's not going to repeat the Old Testament and New Testament, because we already know that. You know, he's going to give a new ideology, he's giving a new direction, and he's going to receive 
controversial because of that, just like Christ himself come. He was controversial while he lived on earth. You know, most likely if we are living on earth in Jesus' time, we were not following. We'd probably be followed by media, be influenced by the media, see what their opinion are. And, uh, you know, I never seen any different teaching than uh, Rare Moon teach about uh, Bible and divine principle because it's all based on it. If you look through divine principle, it quotes Bible verse all the time in all the chapters. and. And we have a, it's, it's a, you can't really take, you can take, if you take the Bible completely, literally, it was going to be, an, it's going to contradict itself. But for example, just like the fruit, for example, it's not, the Bible says, not what goes out of your mouth, in your mouth, that makes you unclean what goes out. And, and, and uh, for a man, uh, you know, it, it's just many things that he have, it's symbol. Jesus self said, I'm talking in symbols, and one day, I'm going to come and tell the whole truth. So I think the most important when we are confronted with a new thing like this is that we pray about it. I think it's the only thing I can say because, uh, you know, we can discuss theology for hours there. I hope that the viewers can see as a result of our discussion that two of the most critical uh, differences between unification theology and Christian theology are the purpose and what actually happened at the cross and the view of Scripture. And to kind of talk about that, uh, first I'll talk about the cross and then about Scripture. In Galatians 6.14, Paul writes, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In 1 Corinthians 2.2, Paul said to the Corinthians, I resolve not to know nothing among you except Jesus and Him crucified. In Philippians 3, 18 and 19, when Paul talks about people who live as enemies of God, the way he says it, he says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So either the cross was originally in God's mind and originally in God's plan for uh, our redemption, or it was not maybe like a contingency plan. And that's something that, that is a difference between us that, that we just have to see. And I guess from my viewpoint, I just quote these verses, and to me, they say it all. The other, the, 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 uh, one thing you mentioned, a smaller point, where you say Paul in uh, Romans uh, 7 talked about the conflict that he still had in him. And yes, Christians do have that conflict because we are in the process of becoming uh, uh, perfected. Positionally, we are pronounced complete in Christ. However, experientially, uh, yes, Christians do still sin, and that we will be uh, uh, complete in every way, uh, sinlessly, perfectly, uh, spiritually in every way, after we die. But the thing is, we don't need Reverend Moon to do that. Uh, finally, though, uh, to talk about the, the scripture, imagine I told you that I had a book Let's say, in this case, it's a fictitious book, actually. And let's say this book said that Reverend Moon was invaded by Satan, and I said this book came from the Unification Church. Would you believe me that a book like that would come from the Unification Church? I imagine you probably wouldn't. Okay. Well, in addition to the quote that Larry said before in the Divine Principle on page 148, uh, it says, Jesus could not accomplish the purpose of the providence of physical salvation because his body was invaded by Satan. Okay. Now, you, if you said earlier that you don't believe that Jesus' body was invaded by Satan, and I'm in for that, I, I agree with you, uh, but yet here is a book that purports to be from God uh, that says that his body was invaded by Satan. Well, I don't think that this book came from God. And from the other errors, scientific and otherwise, that I've seen in this, I think the book basically maybe came from Reverend Moon. And uh, it does not have the, 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 the consistency with Holy Scripture. Uh, it, it is not free from what, from what God, uh, from error. And so there's no way it can be come from God. As to the way, though, that we should interpret Scripture, uh, when somebody says they interpret the Scripture literally or don't interpret the Scripture literally, sometimes that means different things. Sometimes literal interpretation is character, uh, uh, a caricature is made of that as saying, well, you've got to believe every word in the King James or something like that. I guess the, I think the mo most appropriate way is to say that we should take all of Scripture seriously and we should attempt to take it the meant that with the intent that it was written. 
Yes, there are poetic parts in the Bible. Yes, there are allegorical parts. But the point is not to say, well, the whole thing's going to be allegorical because a few parts are, or, 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 or the whole thing should be word for word because some parts definitely should be that way. But the point is to understand the original intent of the authors and not go against that intent. Okay, so uh, for the, I'll give you all a chance to respond. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, we don't believe that Jesus was invaded by Satan. We believe that that was, say, uh, that was the victory of Jesus, is that his heart remained eternally, unconditionally pure, eternally, unconditionally dedicated to God, and uh, that he overcame the temptations of Satan. So because of that, we owe our salvation to Jesus Christ. And in that sense, the cross represents victory because Jesus uh, sacrificed everything on the cross. So we are grateful to Jesus that he went to the cross. But like uh, St. Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr, his, his pain and outrage at, at the crucifixion of Christ, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, that was his words to the people around him. He said, you know, you, cru you murdered the prophets until now, and now you have betrayed and murdered Jesus Christ. That's the kind of pain we feel. And I think many Christians share this feeling. They weep when, you know, Good Friday comes around. We weep when we think of the suffering, the agony of, of Jesus. Um, so I guess I just reiterate, uh, we believe that Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane was not self-centered. We believe that, as all the other acts in his life, they were for the sake, his prayers in Gethsemane were for the sake of God and for the sake of the people whom he loved, God's, God's children. Um, as far as perfection after death, uh, yes, we understand that uh, through Christianity, through the cross, through Jesus, when we go to spiritual world, uh, Christians receive benefit from their love for Christ. They are healed, they're liberated, and they go to paradise, which is a separate realm beyond the accusation of Satan because of their love for Jesus. And we believe that this is unique, that this is the unique attribute of those who love Christ. Um, however, this is a far cry from the way things would have been had Adam and Eve not fallen. Genesis 6, 6, says uh, that God repented that he made man. There's a, a pain and agony that we sense when we read God's words to the Israelites over time because of man's lack of response to him. So our feeling is that God desires every human soul to love him and be one with him. This we see as the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is God's eternal desire. And that's what we believe we need Reverend Moon in order to accomplish. We believe Reverend Moon's mission is to accomplish the kingdom of heaven on the earth. And this is why it's very interesting that the Jews uh, viewed uh, Jesus as coming just for them. Not Jesus, of course, the Messiah. The Jews believed that the Messiah would come only for their benefit. Uh, or at least they, they believed that their enemies would be vanquished and that Israel would be lifted up. But in fact, as Christians who uh, witness the mature growth of the faith of Christ, we understand that Christ came for the whole world. God sent his only begotten son for the sake of the whole world. In the same way, the Messiah comes again to all people. All people receive the inspiration that there will come a great one. The name ranges from second coming of Christ, which is close to you and I, to Messiah to the Jews, the last avatar to the Hindus, the final imam for the Islamic peoples. But all people are awaiting the coming of a great one. We believe that this is because God desires that all people recognize the second coming of Christ as the one for whom they've been waiting. That's why uh, Reverend Moon will embrace people of different faiths and uh, refer to their scriptures from time to time and their great teachers because we believe that God is trying to bring all mankind back to him. As the scripture says, it's God's desire that all people be saved. The Old Testament also um, mentions that God uh, predicts that his presence will be uh, with the people as the water is with the ocean. So with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention and your uh, dedication to God. I'd like to express gratitude for those Christians who uh, love Jesus and love God and keep faith even 
in light of the tribulations that are characteristic of our day. Um, and I'd like to say that if you love Jesus, please pray. Uh, the obvious is not always the true way. Uh, Jesus was crucified as a heretic. That was why he was crucified. Um, so please, don't make the same mistake that the Jews made. If you, don't, if you wonder if what Reverend Moon is saying is true, please just ask Jesus Christ. Ask God. That's what I've done uh, through prayer and fasting. I did fasting and prayer and really begged God to show me uh, how to answer the questions that I had about the meaning of the scriptures. Um, and I, again, I want to thank you for your attention. In conclusion, I want to thank uh, Erling and Laura for being here for this uh, debate and discussion. And uh, in my final statements, I'll uh, mention once again that uh, as Steve just mentioned a moment ago in the divine principle, Reverend Moon says clearly on page 148, uh, therefore, even when Christians believe in and become one body with Jesus, whose body was invaded by Satan, their bodies will uh, still remain subject to Satan's invasion. Uh, it sounds like there's been a, uh, that Laura is contradicting Reverend Moon here in divine principle about Jesus' body being invaded by Satan. I just wanted to reemphasize that point. Uh, as far as the rest goes, I, I want to say that this is a different gospel. This is uh, a false messiah we're dealing with here who's teaching doctrines that are contrary to what we find in the scripture. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, in Matthew chapter 7, since the Unification Church likes to quote from Jesus, I'd like to quote from Jesus also. It, we find in uh, verse 13, Jesus said, Enter ye at, in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So what we have is Jesus saying many are taking a road to destruction because of false prophets and lies and deceit, and few are finding the true way of salvation, which is through the only true gospel, which is found through Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. There's no other name given among men under heaven, by which way you may be saved, than Jesus Christ, as uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says. Jesus is the way, not Reverend Moon. Jesus is the one you should look to, not the divine principle. Christ is the answer. Believe on his name, and thou shalt be saved. God bless you. Thank you very much for viewing the second part of this two-part debate. If you'd like more information about Christian Answers, or if you'd like a copy of our resource list, the address and telephone number of our ministry will appear on the screen. And if you'd like to contact the Unification Church, their address and telephone number will appear as well. Thank you very much for watching this debate. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. To see the one-hour version of this video, go to yahoovideo.com. Type in the name Larry Wessels.